It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, clearly my opinions here are the opinions of not of INSEAD, not of uh, IF, probably not of my wife either. Uh, so I'm going to kind of give you a completely different perspective on ethics to kind of open your mind, because the Netherlands is a country that's open for new ideas. And the reason I got into ethics is because I'm a finance professor. And the finance professor always teaches that companies should maximize shareholder value. And that's all of us do that. And uh, we got criticized because of the crisis. And uh, we got critiques like this one here is that uh, is business ethics incompatible with shareholder value maximization. And some people say that. These are basically Smith and Van Wassenhoven have an article in Business Week saying that shareholder value maximization is really incompatible with business ethics. Now, who is Smith and von Wassenhoff? They are my INSEAD colleagues. Uh, Craig Smith is an ethics professor at INSEAD who got appointed in 2008 by the dean to teach to all the MBAs that what we teach in finance courses is unethical. Now, this is kind of difficult for me to come after him and then teach. And um, so the first thing I got into a debate with Craig, you can watch this on uh, YouTube, it's 5,000 downloads, it's very popular. And then I start going to the dean and I said, listen, this is clearly unethical uh, to screw me around like this. And therefore, we've made a compromise. Now at INSEAD, uh, there are five, six professors that teach ethics. I teach ethics and finance. And what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a summary of what I do there. And uh, when I told my wife I'm going to teach ethics, she said, what? You? And so the typical example of academia, if you can't do, you teach. And, uh, and essentially, the, the, the first thing I did basically is educate my colleagues. Most of my colleagues never took a finance course, so they don't really know what they're talking about. And I tell them, you know, what is shareholder value? Well, shareholder value, the way we teach it in finance courses, is the present value of all future cash flows from now until infinity. If you want to determine pre the value of a company at the beginning of 2008, you have to forecast revenues from now until infinity, cost, taxes, investments, you discount, them at the, you discount them at the cost of capital and you get a present value and that's 1.3 billion, that's the value of a company. So the whole idea that we in finance have a short term view is completely inconsistent with what we do. We are the only profession in the business school that has a long term view. We, we are not, the other areas, they all focus on this number, profits. Uh, every other business school professor, economics, marketing, operations management, they all try to maximize profits. But we never say you should maximize profits. This is one number out of the thousand numbers in this spreadsheet. We don't say that you should basically pay bonuses based on profits. We don't tease this kind of stuff. People confuse shareholder value with profits. It's not about profits, it's about value. If I sell a product to a client that is bad for the client, I will increase profits this year, but because I lose the client, I lose the present value of the fees from this client. So this is an example where I increase profits and lower shareholder value. So this is completely um, inconsistent with um, the idea that we're teaching something unethical. The second thing also is that we, we in, in finance, we, uh, when we do valuations, uh, we basically, essentially, uh, many people say, well, you're, you're focusing too much on the share price. Now, if the market is efficient, uh, this should be the market value of the company, basically 1.3 billion. Of course, the market is not always efficient. The price of the stock reflects a variety of things. Is not necessarily reflecting your expectations in the cash flow, so therefore we tell students you should focus on the spreadsheet. The stock market could be too high, too low. If it is too low, you buy back stock. If it's too high, you issue shares. So kind of, you kind of use your difference of opinion with the market to make strategic tactical financing decisions, but we never said you should manipulate the stock price. We also, people complain that we, care, don't, we don't care about other people. We only care about shareholders. We care about everybody. Look, the slogan today is customer first. Customers are first on the spreadsheet. They're on top. <laughs> they are the revenue. Of course we care about customers. If there was no customers, we had no revenues. Of course we, we, we do care about customers. And of course we care about everybody. The workers are in there. The government is in there. The bondholders are in there. The shareholders are the residual claim holders. They are at the end. They get paid after everyone else gets paid. So the whole idea that, that we don't care about our people is just complete nonsense. Of course, we do care about shareholder value maximization. Why? Because many studies have shown, uh, especially from McKinsey, that in the long run, every industry earns a competitive rate of return. 
So every company earns a competitive rate of return on its capital. So if you don't maximize shareholder value, you won't be able to survive. You also will be attacked to activist investors. People do hostile takeover bids on you. We don't want INSEAD students to pay 60,000 euro tuition and then lose their job because they don't maximize shareholder value. This is why we basically tell them to do this. Right? So at the same time, I really think that maximizing shareholder value may well be an ethical responsibility. I have an article like that. It's published in Craig Smith's book, Shareholder Value and Ethical Responsibility. And why do I do that? Well, I think that ethics should be rethought completely. Today, ethics is about values. And the problem I think with values is they're either general or basically internally inconsistent. This is a bunch of values of a Dutch bank. It says our values are professionalism, integrity, respect and sustainability. Now, if I think about this, then, uh, you know, what does that mean? It sounds great. How can be, who could be against this, right? But they say, what is respect? Well, if I fire a worker, doesn't that show a lack of respect for the worker? On the other hand, if I don't fire him and he doesn't create value, doesn't that show a lack of respect to the shareholders? If I basically start saying, I want to promote sustainability, big thing here today. I'm not going to invest in oil and gas companies. Well, basic finance theory says if I exclude an asset from a portfolio, I make my investors worse off. The only reason to exclude an asset from a portfolio is because the stock is overvalued. So what you're doing is to make your investors worse off. And if you then not say to them, listen, you basically are losing because of our sustainability policy, isn't that showing a lack of respect for the investor? And also, when it's specific, predictions about ethics, many of these are driven by religion and politics. And let me introduce you to another colleague of mine, Mr. Leonardo Lessius, who is a professor, was a professor at Leuven in the 16th century. I was a professor at Leuven, not in the 16th century, but in 1982. And at that time, the University of Leuven set up the Leonardo Lessius Center for Business Ethics. Why Leonardo Lessius had written a book, De Jure et Justitiae, where he was arguing about ethics. And he was basically saying that charging high interest rate is unethical. Now, the church came from a long way. Before that period, charging interest was unethical. The only people allowed to charge interest were the Jews. The Jews lent money to the Catholics, and occasionally the Catholics killed the Jews when they could not pay back their debt. This is the earliest form of debt restructuring we saw in history. <laughs> now, you can say this is a long time ago. It's a very long time ago. But again, if you look at, I read the Pope, Francis' speech on January 29 is exactly the same words. After 400 years, the Catholic Church has not changed their behavior. They don't like capitalism. They don't like people making money. Inequality is bad. All of the same things. Uh, I realize you, you guys quote like very much this French Marxist who uh, wrote a book on inequality. And um, you should live in France. We see these Marxists all the time on the streets. Uh, that's why I no longer stop at pedestrian intersections. There's so many of them. Uh, so. Essentially, this is kind of very personal opinion here. Now, another guy here. This is the European Tax Commissioner. Uh, and he basically gave an interview into the, in the BBC saying that aggressive tax avoidance is immoral. So this guy says that companies should deliberately increase taxes to pay the government for the government budget because otherwise it's unethical. I mean, this is a very personal political opinion. Now, I understand Mr. Semeta, he, he is born in a communist country, uh, Lithuania, and some leftover of this education is still here, but I don't think this is really a guidance for ethics. Um, then there's all these ethical funds. Uh, they say that ethics, uh, they exclude investing in unethical activities, like gambling. Now, I always a puzzle, why is gambling unethical? I mean, the, the biggest casino in the world is the stock market. If you're against gambling, why do you set up a fund? I mean, you tell your customers to gamble. I mean, you shouldn't be setting a fund in the first place. Then the worst thing is alcohol. Jesus turned water into wine. <laughs> he did not turn wine into water. So Jesus approves alcohol. So how can you say it's a sin? I mean, I'm not going to go into pornography, but I'm just telling you. 
that I'm managing a fund, PV Buyback USA, and all my fund is full of these stocks, and that does not make me a sinner. I may go to hell, but not for that reason. And the reason is that, obviously, if you look at empirical evidence, sin stocks beat the market. If I would not invest in these funds, I would be unethical because I would let my own values dominate the profits of my investors. So that's why I don't want to do this. Uh, and then also evidence of politics being mixed with CSR is that Democrats tend to invest in companies with high CSR ratings rather than Republicans, which shows really it's all of these ratings have something to do with political beliefs. So I, I like to take it away from politics and religion and think about ethics in a different way. When I buy shares in a company or work for a company, I'm not joining a church or a political party. Uh, I want to basically think of ethical behavior in business should enhance economic sustainability. Now, this is different from the sustainability we've been talking about here. Basically, you should basically be able to compete in a competitive world, in the world of global competition, and business ethics has a role to play in improving corporate governance. And um, to basically show this, I'm going to show a contractual approach here to life. And contracts are everywhere in life. The relationship between stakeholders in every organization or any kind of business or any unity are governed by explicit and implicit contracts. Think about marriage. How many of you are married? You're afraid to admit. Okay, all right. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Um, if you think about it, marriage has explicit and implicit contracts. Uh, if you think about your own marriage, what's the explicit contract? Maybe a page, right? But there's a lot of implicit contracts. Who will walk the dog? Who will cut the grass? That's on the contracts. When we do a marriage, we have a lot of implicit contracts. Why do we have implicit contracts? Because you're writing an explicit contract for all the possible things you're going to do in your marriage is impossible. It's very costly. It also shows that you don't trust your partner, right? Explicit contract is a substitute for trust. So therefore, we like to have implicit contracts because they're cheap to organize and because they are efficient. Uh, so my argument here is respecting implicit contract is an efficient way to improve corporate governance, cost-efficient way. You don't need lawyers. The lawyers are against my theory because the lawyers will love to see only explicit contracts, but the non-lawyers really appreciate my approach here. Now, of course, explicit contracts could be unromantic. Huh? Example here is that love contracts that make requirements on sex, weight, cheating are increasingly common, experts say. One agreement specified the future mother-in-law won't be joining them on long trips. <laughs> good point, good point. The groom will not watch more than a specific time in front of TV. I mean, luckily I didn't have to sign that contract. And um, the bride agrees to replace her pet when it's dead. Now, this is important. So these are kind of explicit contracts. My prediction is this marriage won't last very long. This seems, this, there's no romance here. There's a lack of trust. So if I bring it to the corporation, again, corporation is also a nexus of contracts. We have different stakeholders. We have the shareholders that appoint the board, the board appoint the management, the management contracts with employees, suppliers, customers, and bondholders. And I will define corporate governance as basically deals with the design and the management of explicit and implicit contracts in such a way as to basically maximize firm value. Now, if I think about the contracts with the various stakeholders, a lot of people have explicit contracts. If you think the, um, the, C the board appoints the CEO and the, basically the board basically specifies compensation, severance payment, performance targets, the duration of the contract, this is typically very explicit. The most explicit contract is probably employees who have a similar contract and they also are protected by all types of government labor laws. So they're a very explicit contract. Uh, we also, the most, probably one of the financial side, the most explicit contract is bondholders. The other day I saw a prospectus for a convertible bond of 500 pages long. I mean, talking about explicit contracts, really all the things that you could do against the bondholder. If you look about the shareholders, if I own shares in a company, what is my contract? Well, I can vote and I can point the board. Uh, and the board basically, at least in some countries, have to be fiduciary responsibility to maximize firm value. You can say, well, the board protects me as a shareholder. The problem is that the board, in many cases, 
are have an informational and skill disadvantage. Again, when they argue against the manager, the manager says we should invest in real estate in Florida. Uh, you have a big issue saying, well, uh, I know about Florida. You know nothing about Florida. So you have a, it's very difficult to argue against the CEO who works every day in the company that you as a board member who show up a few times a year have a better insight in what basically the strategy should be. Moreover, even if board holders basically protect strategic shareholders, there's still minority stockholders who have really have no board representation. And there's differences of interest between controlling shareholders and minority stockholders. I think this is especially the case in Europe, and uh, the interest may diverse. If I think of a minority shareholder, if you're a little shareholder in KPN, what are your rights? You really have no rights. You don't have a right for a dividend. You cannot ask your money back. You can vote, but what's the value of a vote? The whole capitalist system, with separation between management and ownership, is completely based on trust. It's a completely implicit contract. So I think in order to make the system work, you have to kind of specify what those contracts are and kind of respect them. And um, explicit contracts have been the focus of most of the economists and also the regulators. The whole idea, how can we make sure managers care about shareholders? We can think about compensation schemes and bonuses, etc. But not all conflicts can be resolved by explicit contracts. It's very expensive to design these things, and people always get around the system. As we see today, uh, if you put restrictions on bonuses, then everybody increases their fixed salary. It's really not a solution to the problem. Uh, so ethic, I think that ethical responsibility should be, respecting implicit contracts should be, an, should be an ethical responsibility. You basically, well, people may differ on uh, politics and religion. I think we should all accept that respecting an implicit contract with stakeholders is the right thing to do. Of course, that requires making clear what this explicit, implicit contract basically is, and particularly with the shareholder. Now, what are the implicit contracts we see in the world out there? Well, the first one that we see in the Anglo-Saxon world is maximizing shareholder value. The whole idea is that we should make sure that whatever we do is, is one objective to make sure that the residual in the spreadsheet, the present value, is basically maximized. Now, there's some, and this is basically the case in most U.S. firms. When I buy U.S. stock, I think that's more or less part of the contract. On the other hand, as some managers in the U.S. put maximizing shareholder value subject to constraints. Uh, Google, actually, when they went public, they said, we will pay 1% of our profits to charity. Now, everybody knew this in advance. Every investor knows it's priced in the stock. And therefore, that's, that's ethical as well as respecting implicit contracts as well. But it's not respecting implicit contracts. It's last week, or a couple of months ago, that the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, paid 100 million of shareholder value to shareholders' funds to charity. I think that's unethical, because that's really, this was not part of the implicit contract. Steve, jo Steve Jobs never paid money to charity. Mr. Cook is personally worth 500 million. What he should have done is to take 100 million of his own money and give it to charity, and not take my money and give it to charity. Uh, then there are other types of contracts that are also perfectly ethical, like non-profits. If you say, well, if I buy a non-profit as a shareholder, I know I'm going to get nothing. And that's fair as well, because I know basically this in advance. Uh, like a case like INSEAD. INSEAD is a non-profit, so when we make too much money, what do we do? We increase the salaries of the professors so that profits are zero, and that's ethical. <laughs> I keep telling that to the dean. This is your ethical responsibility to make sure you make no money. Uh, and then there's stakeholder value. And I guess this is the also, the speakers today seem to be into the stakeholder value, especially the Netherlands, the continental Europe, they're into stakeholder value. Now, the problem I have with maximum stakeholder value is what, is what does that mean? How do you measure stakeholder value? Maximum stakeholder value makes me think of the Evangelii, according to Matthias, Chapter 6, verse 24, you cannot serve two masters. In other words, you have to decide what are you trying to maximize? What does it mean to maximize stakeholder value? If, if I'm doing a share buyback, my share price goes up, my shareholders like it, the managers may like it because they get stock options, the bondholders don't like it because their risk goes up, and the workers don't like it because they would prefer that the company uses basically the money to create more jobs, increase the salary. So how do I decide what to do? I can justify any decision based on stakeholder value. Bernie Madoff was a stakeholder value maximizer. He's a stakeholder. 
the first people in the Ponzi scheme were stakeholders. They made a lot of money. The people in the end lost. But I just know we have me to tell whether an overall stakeholder value is maximized. This is kind of an excuse to do anything. And also creates ethical dilemmas that are unresolvable. This is actually a question that was suggested to me by a, a Dutch banker of an ethical dilemma in the bank. An employee calls in sick. Uh, should team members take over his or her tasks? And the team members cannot be paid extra, they get a fixed salary. Should they go work overtime, not see their beloved families at 5 o'clock, but only at 8 o'clock? Should they do this? Well, if you believe in shareholder value maximization, the answer is obvious. Obviously, if you don't finish this thing on time, you will not get the contract, shareholders lose. So clearly, you should do it, right? That's the end of the story. If you're a stakeholder value maximizer, it's not obvious. Your shareholders are worse off, but your poor workers don't see their family before seven. That hurts their utility, so it depends who I like the most. Now, what typically happens in those stations, you like the people the most that you know. How many of you have seen a shareholder? Nobody, but you've seen your workers. So what happens? You're going to give in to the workers. So this is my concern about stakeholder value maximization. It creates an environment in which you become inefficient. You basically produce at higher cost than your competitors. I think that is the main threat of stakeholder value to sustainability in an economic sense. Long-term survival it basically is hurting to these attitudes. Another example of um, why you do why you get ethical dilemmas is another example given by another bank to me, saying a client defaults on his mortgage, and you, the banker, arrange the loan. Can you buy the house for your personal investment? I mean, that's a tricky one. If you believe in shareholder value, say, well, well, if the world finds out that bankers lend money to people who then go bankrupt and then they buy their house cheaply, that would be a huge scandal all over the press. Uh, use reputation, so therefore, if I think even there's a small probability that it leads to a scandal, my answer should be, no way, Jose, you cannot do this. Uh, shareholder value maximization tells you, don't do this. If you're a stakeholder value person, say, well, you know, okay, the guy's not done things wrong, we should give our workers some opportunities, so he will benefit, so maybe the shareholders will lose, but we don't know that yet, it's not certain. So, so then again, you become into a messy, decision framework where nothing can be decided because nothing is basically measurable. As Peter Drucker used to say, the famous strategy professor, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So I think that's the issue with the whole stakeholder value business. Nevertheless, what can we do with this framework is to answer a bunch of questions on uh, critique on finance people that we don't care about CSR that we selling products are bad for clients but good for bonuses, that we manipulate spreadsheet in m and transactions, that we have conflict of interest in IPOs. I don't have time to go to these examples here today, but if some of you are interested, I can, you contact Brenda and we'll do a little in-company program. I've developed a bunch of small case studies around these topics so if you're really interested. How many of you are nobody? Okay, well, but let me now go to the lack of concern for CSR. This is a big thing here. According to the Wall Street Journal, not a left-wing rag, right? Saying that ethics teaching should not just be about refraining from cheating and corruption, but recognizing that a company has responsibility beyond the shareholders, wallets to employees, community, uh, customers, and environment. So the question is, uh, is shareholder value maximization inconsistent with CSR? Well, maybe not. Shareholder value may be well consistent, but concerned about an externality. For example, global warming. Uh, you're going to have expensive energy, but you're going to beat global warming. This may well be consistent with shareholder value. If suddenly your revenues go up because your customers say, oh my God, this is a great company. They care about the planet. I will buy their products. Your workers accept lower salaries. They're very happy to work for you because you're doing something for the greater good. Your taxes fall because the government gives you tax credits. And finally, the shareholders that normally only care about money, because that's what we teach in finance, a shareholder cares about compensation for risk. Now, the shareholders think about investing in these companies more than money. 
it's doing good. In other words, I'm not going to get alpha on earth, but I'm going to get alpha in heaven. And therefore, I'm willing to accept a lower alpha on earth. So what am I doing? My discount rate goes down, lowering my shareholder value. So this whole spreadsheet will be, ex and your revenues will go up. Your revenues will go up. Your cost, of, cost will actually go up because of your more expensive energy, but your labor cost may go down, your taxes may go down, and your discount rate may go down. And therefore, it may well be that this whole CSR policy will create shareholder value. It doesn't have to be inconsistent. To give you an example here, it's very difficult to prove this. I mean, there's a lot of papers in academic literature that try to prove this. And uh, half the papers say CSR is good for shareholder value, half of them say it's bad. Uh, but I at least find one case study that shows that CSR indeed for good for shareholder value. And this is the case of from 1996 to 2002, Nuon, a Dutch energy company, uh, sold energy from wind and solar uh, at 60 euro premium above the other energy. So you can buy the same energy, but if you buy it from wind and solar, you pay 60 euro more. At the same time, this was made in an explicit contract, it was put in, in writing. If you get a contract, we're going to put 60 euro in alternative energy. Now, how many of you here would buy this expensive energy? Come on, be honest. How many of you would buy? Nobody. I mean, this is not consistent with my... Come on, don't you care about environment, global warming? Uh, isn't, isn't that Holland obsessed with this? A kind of... Or is this people's a special selected group that doesn't give a damn about it? But, I mean, you're really not a representative Dutch customer. Because what happened, 217,000 individuals in the Netherlands signed up to this. 500 companies paying a higher price for the same thing because you're doing good. Now, however, in 2003, the company kept charging the 60 euro, but they no longer invested in alternative energy. And they didn't tell anybody. But they also didn't put it on writing. They did not say in the contract they did, right? They'd stop. But but they kept starting the 60 euro. Now, in 2013, our good friends from the Financial Dagblad discovered this scandal and spread it all over, and this created a big scandal for Nuon, and got some lawsuits there, but there is no reason for a lawsuit, because did they do anything illegal? They did not. They didn't write it in a contract, but what did they do? They did something unethical. In other words, when you start doing this, when you start pay, charging 60 euro extra, the implicit contract, that you have with your customers is that you're going to put is an alternative energy, otherwise you could not justify this. So what did you do here? You did something unethical. You did something illegal. So this is why ethics and uh, social responsibility could sometimes conflict here. So the takeaways is that business ethics should be about respecting implicit contracts, not because you're going to go to heaven, but because it increases firm value because it allows you to compete in the world. When you say the future of finance, well, there is no future of finance if you can't compete. If you cannot be competitive, that's it. This is the, that's, that's your basically task in life. To the extent that investors who buy shares are led to believe that basically, that the implicit contract is to maximize shareholder value, doing something else I think is unethical. So what you should do, you have to communicate in advance. So when you raise money from your investors, you have to be honest and say, listen, this is a great company, but we're not going to care about you a lot. We're going to care about environment, society, and whatever, and we're going to use your money to do good so I can go to heaven. Now, you should say that honestly. And there are some people that will still give you money. They're called idiots. But people out there, they will give you money, or are masochists. So these people give you money, and then you should take the money. But you should be honest up front with everybody in advance that's what you're going to do. Whatever possible and efficient, you use explicit contracts and avoid conflict between implicit and explicit. And you know, I've been teaching this stuff to, um, to bankers in India, and then it's a great idea, great idea, but my boss tells me I have a profit target next week. If I don't meet that target, I lose my job, so I have to go out and sell stuff now, even I know it's not, I'm gonna sell. Uh, insurance against earthquakes in Belgium. I have to sell it because 
that's the only, uh, this is a bad product, by the way. Um, so that's the whole idea, and of course this is a big challenge, and this is what economists have been thinking about, is how do we, how do we avoid conflicts? You should not base bonuses on profits and concern for shareholder value. And there's one, and people thinking now, I think that the good thing about the crisis, people start thinking about making sure implicit and implicit contracts are reconciled. A nice example is Barclays. Barclays sells cocoa bonds. Now, I don't know why cocoa bonds are bonds that convert, and in this case, the, the total loss cocoa bond of uh, Barclays says that if the capital ratio, the tier one ratio of Barclays falls below a certain level, as a bundler, you lose all your money. Complete wipeout. Now, this is a huge conflict of interest because I have a huge incentive to go and make sure that my ratio falls below the trigger and take it to the cleaners. In order to avoid that conflict of interest, all the bonuses of bankers that are given to sell these products are invested in the cocoa bonds. I mean, that's the way to do it. And this is my advice to you. In order to avoid this problem of the fact that your bankers sell products that are bad for their clients, you give them bonuses, but they have to put the bonus in a pool that contains products they sell to clients. And they have to hold them for five years. And if the client loses money, they'll sync with them. And this is the same principle as asset managers. I'm a, I'm a portfolio manager. My total wealth is invested in my fund. So if I make bad decisions, I get taken to the cleaners. I think that's the way to do it, to create solidarity between the client and the, and the management here. So to give you a final, I hope that the purpose of this lecture is to make you think about implicit contracts in life, and it's not related to sin, and ethics is not related to sin. And to give you an example here, today you're gonna to have dinner, and the implicit contract at the dinner is you will have wine. If you didn't have wine for dinner, this would be completely unethical behavior from the hand of Brenda. It would be really showing the implicit contract is violated. But we give you wine, which is a sinful product. So therefore, sin and ethics are completely unrelated. This is a very nice illustration of this effect. Thank you very much.